Welcome to AP Biology. Today I want to talk about cofactors a little bit, and then we'll talk about enzyme inhibitors, why we have them, and um, how they work. So a cofactor is a non-protein enzyme helper. So here's an enzyme that's in its inactive form. This is the substrate for the enzyme, and you can see that the substrate doesn't fit into the active site. But when the coenzyme is around, which is a cofactor, um, it fits, it, it uh, joins the enzyme, and now the active site is the right shape, and it can work. So this is the active form of the enzyme. So not every enzyme needs um, a cofactor, but some of them do. So the difference between a cofactor and a coenzyme is just that a coenzyme is a type of cofactor. So cofactors are, are non-protein enzyme helpers. Cofactors can be inorganic, like a metallic ion, for example, or they can be organic. If they're organic, we'll call them a coenzyme. Coenzymes include vitamins. So for example, folic acid is a vitamin that convert, is converted to another form, and then it's used to make um, some of the um, nucle some of the uh, nucleotides that DNA is made out of. So if you're doing a lot of mitosis, you need a lot of um, DNA, and you need a lot of folic acid to help make some of those um, nucleotides. All right, enzyme inhibitors. So an enzyme inhibitor, this is a beautiful case um, because enzyme inhibitors do exactly what they sound like they do. So sometimes we have words in science which aren't really what they sound like they are in English. Um, but this is one that actually works because an inhibitor, when I think of in, someone who's inhibited, they're like um, shy, they don't want to talk, right? They feel like kind of withdrawn. Um, if somebody is inhibiting you, they're making you stop. So an enzyme inhibitor is something that stops or decreases an enzyme. So it decreases enzyme activity, um, can even maybe decrease it all the way and stop it. So here's a substrate. Here's an enzyme. They fit together. If you have an inhibitor, it's going to stop, somehow stop that substrate from joining the enzyme. So first I want to talk about why this matters, like why you would ever need inhibitors or why they exist. And then I want to talk about how they function um, in the body. So one reason for them to exist is they're just poisons that, you know, you didn't, you don't have them because you, you didn't make them on purpose, but maybe you ate something that it's acting as an enzyme inhibitor in you. So some poisons are enzyme inhibitors. So imagine um, a cute little bunny rabbit and uh, it's hopping around, minding its own business, right, um, out in the forest. And so here it is. And it's eating grass and stuff, and it happens to come up to a mushroom, and it's like, wow, that's cool. And it, it nibbles it a little bit, takes a little bit, little bite of it. And then it has an upset stomach, and it, it goes ho home uh, to its, uh, I don't know, wherever the bunny lives. And, um, <laughs> and it feels sick, and maybe it throws up, and, it, you know, it's, it's having a really tough night. Um, and then the next day it comes out and it's, it's okay. It only ate a little bit of it and it's going to live a little bit longer, but it sees that mushroom again and it is not going to nibble the mushroom anymore. So sometimes um, organisms like mushrooms will make poisons and they're really defense mechanisms for the mushroom so that anything that eats it then gets sick and knows, hey, I'd, I'd better not go near this thing. So the poison wasn't made by the bunny. It was made by something the bunny ate. So sometimes inhibitors um, of enzymes will, will be poisons that stop an enzyme that you need in order to function. Sometimes you make the inhibitor, though. So metabolism regulation. Metabolism are all the chemical reactions in your body, both the anabolic ones that build stuff up and the catabolic ones that break stuff down. Regulation means you're controlling them. So you might have inhibitors that, de that stop enzymes from functioning when you don't need the product of the enzyme. So there's this thing called um, a metabolic pathway. Let's talk about that a little bit. Metabolic pathway. So metabolism are all your chemical reactions. Pathway means a series of chemical reactions that happen in order to make something. So I have an example of that down here. Here is enzyme one. So enzyme one is getting together with a substrate. Here they are together and they're producing this product except you probably shouldn't call it a product because it serves as a substrate or a reactant to this enzyme too. And so instead of calling it a product, we're going to call it an intermediate because it's the product from enzyme one, but it's the reactant for enzyme two. And then enzyme two takes this um, purple 
rectangle, and it makes this thing, intermediate B. So it's the product for enzyme 2, but it's going to be the reactant for enzyme 3. So this series of chemical reactions to go from the green triangle to the purple rectangle to the blue rectangle-ish thing um, to the square, those are, you know, imagine they're all different chemicals. That would be a pathway. Sometimes an intermediate in the pathway, like this purple thing, maybe it can serve as an intermediate not just for this pathway, but for another one too. And anyway, here you have this end product. If that end product comes back and inhibits this enzyme somehow, then you're not going to be doing this whole reaction again. So that's a type of regulation, right? So we'll come back to this picture a little bit later. But this is why you would make inhibitors in the first place. Sometimes you want to regulate your chemical reactions. Um, tell an enzyme, hey, I don't need you anymore. I've got enough of the stuff that you make right now. Another reason might be that you might want to eliminate harmful enzymes. So. For example, let's say you have um, a living cell. You have a lot of living cells, right, in your body. Um, but then let's say that living cell develops a bunch of mutations over your lifetime. You get to be very old, and you've got a whole bunch of mutations built up in that particular cell line. And then you get one more mutation, and then it develops into a cancerous cell. And so it would be really great if your body could recognize all those mutations and say, hey, you cell that's about to become cancerous and kill me, maybe this cell should die instead. So cell death, it's called apoptosis. We'll have, to have a whole unit on it later. Anyway, the, the enzymes that can take you from living to dead um, for a particular cell would be proteases and nucleases. So your cells are made out of proteins and nucleic acids. So active proteases released into your cell will be enzymes that break down proteins. And active nucleases, are going to be enzymes that break down nucleic acids. So if this living cell gets the signal to release all these enzymes, you're going to kill the cell. So most of the time, you don't want to do that. So you are going to have an inhibitor that says, hey, enzymes, stop. I don't want you doing anything. That means your cell, the cell is going to keep living. If you've developed enough mutations that the cell becomes cancerous, that inhibitor um, will stop working. Hopefully it'll get the signal to stop working, which means you're not inhibiting these enzymes anymore, which means they are released. They do break down the proteins and the nucleic acids in your cell, and the cell dies, which is actually sometimes what you want to have happen with a cell. All right, we'll do a whole unit on that later. It's just sort of a preview uh, as to why you would want inhibitors. So the next thing I want to do is just go over the two types of um, inhibitors that I want you to know. There are competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors, again, do just what they sound like they do. Yay. They compete. So they're competing with um, the substrate for the active site. So here's an enzyme, and here's the substrate, and they fit in beautifully. The substrate fits right into the active site and is processed and be, is, you know, becomes some product. If you have an inhibitor, a competitive inhibitor, the competitive inhibitor competes for that active site. So it physically is going to block the substrate from entering. So they're competing for that active site. They can be either reversible or irreversible. If they're reversible, that means here's the blocker, here's the inhibitor bonded to the enzyme. And that means the substrate can't get in there. But if it's reversible, it came in, it can come out, bounce in, bounce out. When it bounces out, sometimes the substrate can bounce in and the, and the reaction can go forward. So a reversible competitive inhibitor will slow down the enzyme but not completely stop it. If it's irreversible, that means this is stuck in here and the enzyme is just not functional at all anymore. So if it's irreversible, it's usually covalently bonded. That's a, a very strong bond. If it's reversible, that means it's usually a weak bond, like a hydrogen bond. Or ionic bonds aren't weak, but um, water can disrupt them. So ionic bonds can also be reversible a lot of the time. The other type of inhibitor that I want you to know is non-competitive inhibitors. These do not compete for the active site. So here's the enzyme, and here's the non-competitive inhibitor. It's not binding to the active site. It's binding to a different site, and that's changing the shape of the enzyme, making the active site either completely wrong or at least a little bit worse than it was. If it's completely wrong, then you'll get no uh, reaction while this inhibitor is here. If it's just like morphed it a little bit, changed it a little bit, maybe, maybe it's just decreased the affinity for this 
substrate a little bit, that's just going to sort of slow down that enzyme. But sometimes the active site's just so messed up that the reaction's not going to happen at all. So non-competitive inhibitors bind to another part of the enzyme, causing the enzyme to change shape, making it uh, making the active site either less effective or not effective. Um, here are some examples. So aside from the poisons that we talked about just a minute, are toxins kind of the same thing? Um, they could also be in pesticides. We could also have them as inhibitors, right? Like like to regulate metabolism. But another example is pesticides. So um, for example, um, a type of ant poison. Here's an ant, and I don't like ants in my house either, but uh, a type of ant poison is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Whoa, big words. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So what the heck does that mean? Um, ants, like us, have neurons, and that's supposed to be a neuron. Come on, it's a pretty neuron. Anyway, the message is going this way, and then it is affecting a muscle cell. So here's a neuron, and a neuron can tell a muscle cell, hey, it's time for you to contract. And the way that the neuron tells the muscle cell, oh, shoot, what did I just do? <laughs> I don't know what I touched. Okay, um, the way <laughs> something. Okay, so really, really, what did I just do? Okay, sorry. Okay, so the way that it works is the neuron is going to release a neurotransmitter. In this case, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. That acetylcholine tells the muscle cell to contract. You want to have that neuron tell the muscle to contract when it's supposed to tell it to contract, but sometimes, um, like, you'll tell the muscle cell to contract, but you don't want it to contract forever. So after you've told it to contract, you want to be able to say, hey, you need to stop contracting right now. So you'll have acetylcholinesterase, an enzyme. Um, oops. Acetylcholinesterase, I didn't mean to erase my poor neuron. Acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that gets rid of it, which is good. You need to sometimes tell your muscle, okay, you can stop, um, you know, you can stop now. And so you have um, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that gets rid of the acetylcholine. There's a poison or several poisons actually, several pesticides um, that are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. That means you're never breaking down your acetylcholine, which means the acetylcholine is always here which means that muscle is always contracting, which means your heart is always contracting, which means it can never relax. So you can't really pump blood that way, for example. Um, so the bummer here, be careful, because acetylcholinesterase inhibitors could affect your acetylcholinesterase too, not just, um, not just an ants. Last idea here, um, antibiotics. So an antibiotic is a medicine that kills bacteria. It's important to develop antibiotics that kill bacteria, but not you. So if there's an enzyme in bacteria that's not in you, a nice antibiotic would be to block or inhibit that enzyme because it wouldn't affect an enzyme in you if you don't have that enzyme. All right, a couple definitions here. Allosteric site. An allosteric site is a site other than the active site. So the non-competitive inhibitor binds to an allosteric site, which changes the shape of the protein, the enzyme, which changes the shape of the active site. An allosteric site is, um, you can apply that to um, a site where an inhibitor binds. Or an allosteric site can also be a site where an activator binds. So we'll talk about that in another video. If there's an inhibitor binding, it says slow down or decrease enzyme activity, right? It decreases enzyme and enzyme activity. So an inhibitor will decrease enzyme activity and activator will increase enzyme activity. All right, non-competitive inhibitors can be reversible or irreversible. Again, if they're reversible, they're hopping on and off. If they're irreversible, they're stuck on there and the enzyme's no longer functional. So what I wanna do um, finally is draw um, 
what you would see with substrate concentration versus rate of reaction. So we did a lab like this the other day where we had a bunch of cuvettes. I'm just drawing test tubes right now. In those test tubes, we put in um, some enzyme. Ooh, pretend I drew all those the same. So in those test tubes, we're going to put in uh, some enzyme. So here's the enzyme. So you're putting in the same amount of enzyme in every test tube. But you're putting in varying concentrations of um, substrate. So this substrate concentration, you start at zero. So this one gets no substrate. And these all get um, substrate, but different amounts. So the substrate varies. So you might remember that if you have a substrate, substrate and um, it's exposed to the enzyme then hopefully you are going to make a product <laughs> that says product <laughs> okay so um, rate of reaction is really how much product you make over time so in 10 seconds how much product have you made so if you have no substrate you are going to make no product so that means you're going to start down here so um, I don't actually, I'm going to be a little bit picky about yeah, extra lines on here for just a minute. Okay, so what you should see is as you get a little bit more substrate, you're going to have a little bit faster rate of reaction because now I at least have some substrate. There's not a lot of them though, so they're not bouncing into the few enzymes that I have in there. But as I have more and more and more substrate, there the substrates are more likely to bounce into the enzymes. So the rate of reaction, how fast those enzymes work, increases. Eventually, those substrates are those enzymes are working as fast as they can, and they can't work any faster. So at some point, it doesn't really matter how much extra substrate I put in, because the enzymes are like, oh my god, I can only work so fast. I don't care how many more substrates there are. I can only, you know, process so many substrates in in ten seconds, and and that's all I can do. So this is in a you know fixed amount of time. So we did that experiment the other day. So now I want you to think about what it would be like if instead um, you added, let's see, let's do, um, let's do red, let's do orange. Uh, let's say now you're adding a competitive inhibitor into each test tube. So you're going to do the whole experiment all over again, but you're adding in um, a little bit of a competitive inhibitor now into each one. So what will that look like? So what you should think about is it's an inhibitor, so it's going to decrease reaction rate, right? So it's going to look kind of, whoops, oh man, I'm having a, a little bit, struggling a little bit. Okay, so you are going to have a lower rate overall, um, right? So an inhibitor decreases reaction rate. You would expect the reaction rate to go down. But what happens as you get more and more and more substrate? So here is, the, let's draw it right here. Here's your enzyme, and here's your substrate. And this is your inhibitor. And if you have like the same amount of substrate and the same amount of inhibitor, they're going to be duking it out. They're going to be fighting for that active site. But let's say you get to a really, really, really um, high concentration of substrate. Let's say you have a thousand substrate molecules for every one inhibitor. Who's going to win? Well, with a thousand substrates, the substrate's going to win, right? So that substrate's going to make it into that active site more often than the inhibitor. So at really, really, really high substrate concentrations, you're actually going to come very close to that original line. So this one is a competitive. What you'd get, the kind of um, reaction rate you'd get with a competitive um, inhibitor. So yeah, the reaction rate is lower. But when you get really, really high levels of substrate, it really overwhelms that competitive inhibitive inhibitor. I should say this is a reversible right, inhibitor. And then that original blue line, I should label that uh, while I'm thinking of it. This is no inhibitor. OK, so what happens instead if I don't use um, a competitive inhibitor? So I'm going to take that out. I'm going to do a totally new experiment. Uh, ooh, whoops. 
oh, I forgot it in there. Anyway, uh, I got to redraw that, uh, that test tube that I erased. Okay, so let's say you repeat the whole experiment. You put in your enzyme, you put in your substrate, except no substrate here, right? But instead of a competitive inhibitor, you're going to put a non-competitive inhibitor in there. So what do you think? Light blue? How about, um, yeah, light blue will work. So I'm going to put in, yeah, that's pretty, right? I'm going to put in a non-competitive inhibitor into all of these. So non-competitive inhibitor. So that non-competitive inhibitor binds to a site other than the active site. So what will that line look like? Well, it's an inhibitor, so you're still going to have a lower line here, right? Somewhere around where that reversible competitive inhibitor is. And let's say it's also reversible, right? So this blue line is going to be a reversible non-competitive Non, oh my God, that says non-competitive <laughs> inhibitor. So here's the thing, at really high substrate concentrations, I don't care if I have a thousand um, substrates. My inhibitor doesn't have to compete for the active site. So my inhibitor is still gonna work. I don't even care if there's a gazillion of these, right? My non-competitive inhibitor goes somewhere else. It doesn't have to duke it out for that, for that active site. So for a non-competitive inhibitor, it's just going to decrease the rate overall. So you're going to see a line that mimics this no inhibitor, but it's just lower the whole way. This chart is kind of hard. So if, you, if that didn't make sense to you from the beginning, spend a little more time on it. I, I think it's kind of a tough one, but it's a really important one. Um, graphs are, are really important. Um, try to talk yourself through each part of it. Like, hmm, when I, when I was watching kids in class, they were like, I don't know, do I start um, down here or do I start up here just for this initial line? Talk yourself through it. If you have zero substrate, draw the reaction out. If I have zero substrate, how much product will I make over time? None, right? So you're going to start down here. So, all right, bye.